stories are the most powerful thing on earth. They are literally life and death. Wars are waged based on the story of who is the hero and who is the villain. You are the result of a story your parents told each other. The one night stand, the soulmate, and friends who became so much more. Life and death. So wouldn't you like to understand them better, these stories? How Story Works, an elegant guide to the crafts of storytelling by Lonnie Diane Rich, demystifies stories and helps you understand why you love what you love, why you hate what you hate, and why prologues are almost always a bad idea. How Story Works by Lonnie Diane Rich. Available on Amazon in ebook, audiobook, and paperback form. Get your copy today. Welcome to Still Pretty, a Buffy the Vampire Slayer podcast from Chipperish Media. I'm story expert and God's gift to the bell curve, Lonnie Diane Rich. And I'm film scholar and big, beefy, guy-like girl, Noelle LaCroix. <laughs> and we're here today to talk about Inca Mummy Girl, the fourth episode of season two. Yes, yes, we are. We are here to do that. Inca <laughs> Mummy Girl aired on October 6th, 1997. It was written by Matt Kine and Joe Rinkmeyer, who also wrote season one's The Pack. Inca Mummy Girl was directed by Ellen S. Pressman. This is the last episode of Buffy for both writers and the directors, so we wish you a fond farewell and hope things... Worked out nicely for you in other arenas <laughs> 20 years <laughs> in the past. <laughs> Coming to you from the future. <laughs> right. <laughs> if this is your first episode of Still Pretty, welcome. At any point on this show, we may talk about anything that happens in the whole run of Buffy, and spoilers abound. One of these days, you're going to have to get a grown-up car. But until then, let's go on patrol. In Inca Mummy Girl, Buffy et al. visit a museum on a field trip, and when disposable bad boy Rodney tries to steal an ancient seal from a mummified Incan princess, a hand reaches out and pulls him in for the literal kiss of death. Later at the bus station, an exchange student named Ampata, who is coming to stay with Buffy for two weeks, gets off his bus and meets up with the mummy, who kisses him, becomes a real girl, steals his identity just in time for Buffy to take her home. You must teach me everything about your life. I want to fit in, Buffy. Just like you. A normal life. Xander is instantly taken with Empata because she is beautiful and supernaturally dangerous. What I'm saying is, Xander has a type. The crew goes to the museum to look for Rodney and finds him in the mummy's sarcophagus along with a broken seal. They are attacked by a man in ancient clothing who runs off. At school, Giles gives Empata a piece of the broken seal and asks her to translate. Is, is, is there anything you recognize here? Um, um, this, this, um... This chappy with a knife, for instance. Well, I do not know exactly, but I, I think this represents, I believe the word is bodyguard. Willow is bummed about Xander liking Ampata. Giles figures out that the princess mummy killed Rodney, and the bodyguard attacks Xander and Ampata. Ampata gets upset and tells them to destroy the seal. Willow tells Xander to take Ampata to the dance. That's a good idea. We'll all go. No, I mean, just you. But you're a sight in your costume. I'll see you there. You know what, Willow? You're my best friend. I know. Giles tells Buffy she can't go to the dance because they have to go to the museum to find out what's going on with this mummy business. Ampata and Xander go together and meet up with Willow, who's dressed in Eskimo garb. Giles shows up at Buffy's house. The bodyguard was found at the high school mummified. They both suspect Ampata and go up to Buffy's room to look in her luggage, where they find the mummified corpse of the real Ampata. How about this one? What kind of girl travels with a mummified corpse and doesn't even pack a lipstick? While Buffy and Giles rush to the dance, the bass player of the band, a boy named Oz, notices Willow and is captivated by her, as any reasonable girl-oriented person should be. Xander and Ampata dance and are just about to kiss when she starts to turn back into a corpse. She runs off and finds Jonathan, a geeky kid sitting on the stairs. 
Meanwhile, Giles drops Buffy off at the dance and goes to the museum to reassemble the seal and stop Ampata. Aren't you with Xander? Does it look like I'm with Xander? Ampata tries to kiss Jonathan, but Xander interrupts and Jonathan runs off. They kiss and Ampata starts to suck the life out of him, but then stops herself. She runs off just as Buffy finds Willow and tells her about Ampata. They locate Xander, dazed but still alive. They rush to the museum to warn Giles, but Ampata knocks him out before Buffy interrupts her. I'll say one thing for you Incan mummies. You know, kiss and tell. They fight and Ampata knocks Buffy into the sarcophagus, closing her in. Willow runs in and Ampata grabs her, about to give her the kiss of death. Xander stops her. You want life? You're going to have to take mine. Can you do that? Yes. Ampata tries to kiss the life out of Xander, but Buffy breaks out of the sarcophagus and pulls her off Xander just as she turns into a full corpse. Everyone leaves the scene for a very confused museum janitor to find later. At school the next day, Buffy sympathizes with Ampata, saying she got a raw deal. I remember how I felt when I heard the prophecy that I was going to die. I wasn't exactly obsessed with doing the right thing. Yeah, but you did. You gave up your life. I had you to bring me back. All right, so there's just a ton of stuff that is problematic in this episode. And I don't know, I'm going to do it just as a list in under a minute so we can talk about narrative because I love it. Okay. I love it. Call it all out, Noah. All right, here we go. (laughs) Here we go. And uh, if I miss stuff, let me know. But in this episode, we have racism, cultural appropriation, patriarchal entitlement to women's bodies and experiences, casual transphobia, the real Empata Gutierrez has no country of origin, othering via soundtrack, pretty much everything Xander says, especially with regards to speaking Spanish, Xander's treatment of Incan Princess Empata, Xander shoving an entire Twinkie into his mouth because why? (laughs) Joyce's two days in America and it already seems like she belongs here line, everything Cordelia says to or about Sven, and several unfortunate (laughs) words choices, which I will not repeat. Nicely done. Thank you. All right. So it's all bad. We recognize that it's bad, but really we just want to talk about the story. It's so... Not that there's actually that much to talk about. There's <laughs> Inca not Mama, a Mummy Girl <laughs> is one of the like, you know, worst episodes of Buffy, I think. It's just not great. There's not much there. And what's there is kind of, you know, offensive and not fun. <laughs> and uh, yeah, even just done. seeing Willow in the Eskimo costume. You know, She's, yeah, in in Sunnydale, California in October, like it's got to be 400 degrees inside that outfit. I love Willow in her her costume for the dance. I love that she can't turn her head. She I has know. to turn her whole body. It's yes, very, it's very, cute. it's very sweet and very sad. <laughs> yes. But yes, yeah, um, I mean, this episode is is troubling in so many ways. And mm-hmm. I was really tempted to do a deep dive into the use of brown bodies as props mm-hmm. and the death of Latinx characters meaning absolutely nothing. I mean, right. the real Ampara Gutierrez comes to stay in Sunnydale for two weeks, dies, ends up yeah. in a trunk in Buffy's house. I mean, presumably he has a family somewhere you would think so who's going to notice that he doesn't come home but it it also occurred to me that that's just kind of how things go mm-hmm. in Sunnydale um I think, right I mean we have a lot of dead kids yeah that we don't follow up on but this dead kid is dead in a trunk in Joyce's house like yeah. Joyce is gonna have to explain that to someone and I mean even in the real world let's face it we do tend to treat brown bodies without As a lot of respect disposable but, yeah yeah but I mean still like this is this is a big effing deal and as a mother like can you imagine if you were supposed to have a, a you know 16 year old yeah up and was dead inside a trunk. Like, that's a big damn deal. But it's treated like nothing. But it's yeah. interesting. I mean, that just seems to be how death works in Sunnydale. Right. Because, of mm-hmm. course, we have Rodney, who's introduced. Rodney, is that his name? See, I don't even know his name. Who's introduced <laughs> in the beginning as this bad boy with braces just to die. That's yeah, his Rodney. Whole, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's his whole yeah. 
thing. So I think that there's definitely a lot of terroir racism going on in this episode. Mm -hmm. But I'm really curious about, from a narrative perspective, how death in Sunnydale works. I mean, I sort of get it, but I also don't get it. Yeah. Why is it that we fear for the lives of some characters while other characters can die horribly and it's no big deal? Oh, because there's the people who matter and the people who don't. The people <laughs> who are fodder for the, the mill of death in Sunnydale. And every now and again, they call it out. And like, I get it, right? You know, we can't feel every death in Sunnydale equally because it, it's just it would be too emotionally exhausting and we live in a space where you know people are getting killed all the time right like Sunnydale has a vampire problem Sunnydale has a hell mouth like stuff is happening in Sunnydale the property values must be just in the basement right <laughs> um and you know and kids and we're at a high school and kids are getting killed kids are getting killed like we had all those kids who died um in prophecy girl right yeah. you know the bloody handprint on the tv with the cartoon running like mm -hmm. all of that stuff is and we felt that we saw willow feel that you know we saw yeah. cordelia feel that um and so we do but like there is there's so much death that is simply you know brushed off and ignored it is just another clue to be followed and and they're fighting a war against the things that kill people so feeling every death is not um is not something that we can necessarily do in the narrative and like sure. i understand that but very specifically when when it's a brown person <laughs> very yeah. specifically when it's somebody from a community that we as a country, I'm sorry, the United States is racist. If that's news, I'm really sorry um, that we as a country tend to devalue. Um, that hits, I think, a little bit harder. Mm -hmm. It feels worse. Um, and even though I don't think we acknowledge or really care about Rodney's death much more than no. we care about anybody else's. Um, and he was a white boy, you know, so I mean, there is that. Um, but yeah, it's it's troubling and in a lot of ways and death in Sunnydale I think is something that you just sort of have to accept that this is an environment where these things happen pretty often and Buffy is in the business of of trying to prevent more death mm -hmm. so that's what we're focusing on sure you know is getting the bad guy rather than focusing on the victims and narratively you know I understand that that happens in stories like this you know yeah yeah I understand that it's part of the world that we're in it just it mm -hmm. occurred to me as I was thinking about the characters who die in this episode that there is this idea that genre, I think, determines how you deal with death overall. Yeah. I mean, that's not right. that's not what Buffy as a show is doing. We're not talking about these deaths. We're talking about Buffy and her friends fighting yes. the forces of darkness. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. But it's a I mean, it's a weird it's a weird detail in this particular episode. Well, there's episode always that, disposable, like the yeah. red shirts on Star oh, Trek, yeah. right? That if anybody was wearing a red shirt, you oh, know yeah. they're going to die because they just like, they have these disposable crew members on these shows, you know? <laughs> and I mean, that's just how, that's how it is. Yeah. Like, and, and I get that. And there are reasons that have nothing to do with racism. Yeah. It's all about narrative and, and telling the story that you're there to tell. And if it's not about the death, but the death is something that you use to raise the stakes, then that is, you know, mystery and novels like all this mm -hmm. kind of stuff death is is stuff that happens and we have to resolve the mystery of it we have yes. to punish the bad guy yeah um and and keep the bad guy from killing anybody else and and do preventative measures but overall it's you know it's just how that kind of narrative works sure so all right so shall we talk about our bad guy who's actually a bad girl and is really yeah i think it's kind of interesting Right. I mean, and, and the reason like from a narrative perspective, right, a good villain is somebody whose motivation we can understand. Right. Right. And here is this girl who is, let's not forget, a um a projection of Buffy. We even have her bodyguards specifically refer to her as you are the chosen one. Yes. Right. So she was the chosen one because she was chosen. She was sacrificed at a young age, which is not that different from what we do with Buffy and all of the Slayers, right? They're all sacrificed, mm -hmm. right? So here we have this sympathetic parallel that we can see between Empata and Buffy, right? Yes. Um, that they are not that different and that she is really just trying to live. Now she's killing other people so that she can live. We cannot have that, 
right? Mm -hmm. Because she has to kill, it looks like, every four to five hours. Yeah. So she essentially is not that different from a vampire, right? Yeah. You know, you kill to live, right? Vampires can live, I guess, without drinking blood, but it's going to be pretty miserable and awful. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, they have to do that to, like, sustain themselves. And so she's not that different. It's It's really kind of interesting. But, you know, at the same time, we can sympathize with her. She's a 16 year old girl. She had her life taken from her because other people, men decided that she, you know, was the thing to be sacrificed. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so yeah, it's, it's interesting. I like the fact that we have a villain that we can sympathize with, uh, cause we don't usually have that. Usually they're just yeah. demons. They're just vampires. They're not sympathetic. You know, uh, we will do that more as we move through Buffy, but up to this point, we haven't done a whole lot of that. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's interesting that she is sympathetic, but at the same time, she's also making a choice that we cannot condone. Right. Right. And she really is sympathetic. I mean, at yeah. least from my perspective, I oh, sure. felt bad for her the whole time. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's not fair. No, it's really, it, it's really not. And of course she's there as a nice parallel with Buffy. Um, mm -hmm. You know, she's got this, Ampata has this uh, bodyguard who is very much like a watcher in a yes. way. Um, not unlike a watcher. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And her relationship with him as, you know, minimal as we get to experience that is kind of similar to Buffy's relationship with Giles in right. that Giles will say you don't have a choice and Buffy says yeah I'm going to I'm going to do this right. I'm going to the stance or I'm going like she gets her way talking to Giles about choice and you know what she should right. get to do and i don't I, we have that yeah. very conversation right buffy argues for the individual and and giles argues for the role mm -hmm. right your role you are a slayer this is what you have to do this is your you know sacred calling responsibility and she's like i just want to go to a dance yeah you know and no one likes a non-budger no one likes <laughs> a non-budger and then he gives in and he yeah. says, all right, go to the dance. Right. And then, of course, he takes the dance away from her a mm -hmm. little bit later. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but still, it's kind of, you know, we do see a real reflection between there's not there's not a whole lot of clear blue sky between the systems that put Ampata into that sarcophagus and the systems that put Buffy into the role of Slayer. Yeah, and Ampara, I'm pretty sure, comes from Amparar in Spanish, which means uh, to protect. So uh -huh. she's a protector. Is she defender. a slayer? She's I, super strong. Okay, I looked at that too, that fight at the end, and I'm like, mm -hmm. and that she closes the sarcophagus with one hand. And I'm thinking... Well, she lifts up Giles. Or, yeah. Right? She lifts up the bodyguard. She overpowers the bodyguard. I think I that, mean, is she a slayer? She's a chosen one. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. It's entirely possible. Did they sacrifice their slayers? Huh. That's an interesting idea. I do I not know. know. I mean, and because, of course, we're dealing with the Incans who, mm -hmm. you know, actually existed. That was one thing that I thought was interesting. They got the, like, the region Mm -hmm. Correct. But then just made up a bunch of stuff <laughs> to go right. with. They're like, yes, Incans and Peru. And I'm like, oh, OK, that's yeah. yeah. I grew mm -hmm. up in Southern California. We learned all about uh, you know, a lot of that right. that history. But mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know if she's a slayer. I think she's a, a movie monster. You know, we right. did our Frankenstein's mm -hmm. monster and now we're doing our mummy and mm -hmm. we need a mat like we need a magical, super strong, supernatural creature because there's something about being supernatural that makes you super strong, apparently. Yes, yes. And she obviously does have a supernatural element, you know, because she was able to come back to life as soon as the seal was broken. Yeah, and apparently yeah. she's listening to everything that learning goes on English, around her. Learning sure. English, traveling yeah. in the United States as a mummy. So she was conscious in that oh, body. Oh, God, that's this whole horrifying. Time conscious in so, that body the fact that she came out as as you know i mean she's murderous obviously yeah. but the fact that she came out with any semblance of sanity you know oh my god i mean <laughs> yeah it's it's dark if you start thinking about well, yeah. this on any level it's dark and the fact that after she's <clears throat> literally ripped apart 
at the end. They rip her apart. If she was conscious as a mummy in the sarcophagus, is she conscious as a mummy in pieces? Is she aware of what is happening to her body? That's yeah, a horrifying before idea. Before it was the seal that was the source of the magic. The seal is broken. The magic right. goes into her. So I am going to head canon <laughs> that the seal was broken. The magic went into her. She was resurrected. And then it's just regular death. Okay. Like anybody else, because she wasn't, she didn't die as part of this ceremony that right. that involved the making of the seal and all of that magic. She didn't die in a magical way, where it seems like she was sacrificed in a magical way. Yeah, I mean, yes. Okay. <laughs> so, I'm guessing. I mean, I'm just going to headcanon that because it's it's dark. Meanwhile, Amy's mom is still stuck inside yes. that cheerleading trophy. Uh-huh. That's dark. And uh, in a little while, Oz is going to look at that and say, it looks like her eyes are following me. And it's kind of a funny callback, except, oh, my God. So that brings us to Oz, you though. Oz. I love Oz is the best. I love Oz so much so much and he's just the tiny part of this episode but he is absolutely the highlight of this episode this is the reason why I like Inca Mummy Girl at all and it's not even like I hate like Inca Mummy Girl like it's it's just not it's just a lot of like really weird stuff and it doesn't really come together and it's kind of like whatever but but Oz is the light in this episode I love Oz so much I think Mm -hmm. Oz is my absolute favorite male character on Buffy, full stop. Oh, he's good. I don't know if he's, I don't know if I like him more than Giles, but he's real good. I will Mm -hmm. check that as we go Mm -hmm. through this Mm rewatch, but I love Oz. Um, He's fantastic. And I was trying to tease out what it is that I like about Oz. Why do I like him like right away? Because Mm -hmm. with a lot of the characters on the show, I like them for who they become over the course of the show. Mm -hmm. But I like Oz immediately. And I was thinking about that. And it seems to me like often that sort of relaxed and groovy guy is relaxed and groovy because he's not especially intelligent. He's just kind of he's sort of going with the flow and he's really happy to just do whatever. But Oz is very, very bright and Mm -hmm. he's relaxed and groovy because he's emotionally mature. Yes. He's Mm -hmm. maybe the most emotionally mature character on the show. Oh, definitely on Buffy, possibly ever on television. He is, um, what I love about Oz is that um, he is a genuinely good person, but he's not performatively good. Yes. You know, he, he's not interested in what other people think of him. Um, And he doesn't spend a lot of time judging other people like other people can do what they do. And he's like, dude, that's your path. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, whatever your thing is, that's your thing. You know, like Devin is there objectifying (laughs) Cordelia and pretty much every other woman. And Oz is speaking for himself. Yes. Right. You know, and so this is the thing that I love about him is that he he will reflect back on Devin and give Devin an opportunity to maybe see things a different way. But he's not judgy about it. No. You know, and he's not he's not like really like, look how good I am I'm such a good person and you are really not like it has nothing to do with anybody else these are the standards he sets for himself he lives by those standards and then what other people do is really other people's problem and I like what that does for him is it gives him the ability to see things clearly like we have Cordelia who is our truth teller Mm -hmm. you know and Oz seems to be our truth liver like without that sounding like an organ in the body like he lives (laughs) He lives that truth like he he lives to it. He lives by it. He thinks deeply. He feels deeply, but he's really taciturn. Mm -hmm. He's very quiet, but he's also really funny. You know, like when he says something, (laughs) he's just kind of like naturally funny and adorable. And I love, love, love after we have Xander failing spectacularly to appreciate what Willow is and how lucky he is that this woman even speaks to him. Right. Yeah. And Oz, without talking to her, without anything, sees her across a room and he knows. He knows what she is just seeing her across the room. Yeah. And she's beautiful and whatever, but it's not about that. Like he sees her. And I think that is so fantastic. I love this whole relationship, you know, and so watching it from the start is such a delight. It's so wonderful. I love Mm -hmm. 
I love Seth Green's reading of every line he's given when yeah. Devin is trying to get him to talk about how hot Cordelia is. And he goes, <laughs> that is a hot girl. He just, right. I mean, like, I even I used more inflection than he uses saying it just right. now. Because he mm-hmm. just... I mean, and we've all been in that conversation, right? Where we're we're right. talking to someone and we're like, what do I say to just end this conversation? Because this is not right. this is mm-hmm. not an avenue that I would like to explore with you. <laughs> <laughs> what do I say just to put the little end cap on the conversation? And I I exactly. just adore it. I yeah. love it so much. Um He's so cool. And the slow just the slow burn, slow growth of the Oz and Willow relationship is I know my favorite. It's so wonderful at this point where we know we have so much of that ahead of us. Yes. Like the whole Oz and Willow thing is ahead of us. And so you can just kind of enjoy it at the beginning and be like, oh, this is the beginning of such a wonderful thing. Yeah. And I love Oz and I love Willow and I love them together. And it is really going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Meanwhile, we have Xander and Willow in this episode just breaking my heart. Oh my god! In a I million know. pieces. Oh my god! When Xander is that moment. talking to Buffy about Willow I and how know. you know he doesn't think of her as someone. Well, okay. First of all, I was like, Buffy's like, "Have you never thought about her lips?" And Xander's like, "Nope." And I'm like, "Hello, <laughs> wait a minute." Bef- <laughs> what? Like what? Three right. episodes ago? Three episodes mm-hmm. ago, you were about to kiss Willow. You almost kissed her. I can't with that. I can't. I know. Like, Sander, what? I know. I hate this romantic like, and amnesia. How what is that whole going thing? on and with he that? Was, he was going in for the kiss. He has thought about Willow that way. But we're retconning that clear out and we're making him, you know, say, I love Willow and Willow's face lights up. And but she's, you know, the kind of girl that I'm best friends with and all this kind of stuff. And it's just so sad. And then Willow feeling so bad with Empata. Oh, my God. Um, but it's so sweet because that moment when she says, no, you should take Empata to the dance it's just the two of you yeah. and I'll I'll show up later and I'll see you there. Um it is such an expression of real love from Willow that she puts his happiness above her own. Yeah. And you don't see that a lot in these kinds of stories. No. You know? Um but I also love when she's talking with Buffy. You know, and she yes. says, well, either I can <laughs> wait while Xander dates every other girl in the universe until he finally gets to me, or I can go on with my life. And Buffy's like, good for you. And she goes, well, I didn't choose you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's so sweet. So, I mean, it's just, it's God. really, it's really sweet. And there's this really just dear quality mm-hmm. to Willow's relationship to and with Xander. But it also struck me in this episode how mature these conversations about crushes are for high school students like Mm -hmm. I can imagine having these conversations now with friends you know if I had feelings for somebody in my friend Mm -hmm. circle and that person didn't have feelings for me or whatever like I feel like we could talk in that sort of open honest way about hey I feel this way Mm, I don't feel this way and then there are big feelings and we process them right Mm -hmm. but for Buffy and Willow and Xander to be so casual about, well, we know that Xander's into Buffy and Willow knows and Buffy knows. Mm -hmm. You know, there's this really just sort of relaxed space Mm -hmm. around the the kind of unrequited love, I guess. And I don't, I don't know what to do with that. Like, it feels really interesting and noteworthy among Mm -hmm. these characters. Um, But I'm not really sure what to make of it other than it just makes for compelling storytelling because it's great. It does. It's good storytelling. It gets this this level of conflict, you know, this area of conflict out on the table where we're talking about it openly. It's actually textual, Mm -hmm. you know, rather than subtextual. So we're acknowledging it. Um, And it, it adds this layer of, you know, heartbreak for Willow. 
you know, that we get to experience with her. So I think that it's it's nice to see them discussing it so openly, mm-hmm. you know. Um, it's fun because Buffy knows yes. you know, how Willow feels about Xander. And Xander obviously knows how Willow feels about Xander, but he's just not really dealing with it. Yeah. Um, but so it's a nice kind of, of roiling personal conflict. It's not a narrative conflict, but it's a personal conflict that we add on and that we have moving through this story. And... Um, and the nice thing is that we see Willow, you know, like hurting so much and like pining over Xander and feeling all this stuff. And then there she is getting attention from the literal coolest guy on the planet. She didn't even realize it. Yep. She didn't even know. Yep. You know. But it's nice to see somebody because as much as I love Xander and I do, Xander is a problem. He is a problem in a lot of ways. You know, <laughs> Oz is so much Xander's superior in pretty much every single way. Yeah. <laughs> so to see somebody of that quality acknowledging Willow's quality and her getting that attention, even though she doesn't realize she's getting it, it was really nice. So great. I just yeah, Oz and Willow. <laughs> Oz and like... Willow. It's so nice. So it's great. so nice. All right, so here's a question for you. Yeah. And feel free to tell me I'm wrong here, because I think maybe I am, right? <laughs> but there's a thing that happens a lot in our storytelling, and and specifically, like, with a lot of the very patriarchal, you know, inspired ideas that happen in Joss Whedon's work. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of stuff in Joss Whedon's work. And, you know, if you listen to Still Dead this week, you heard all about it. Because um, <laughs> there's some bad, bad stuff that happened on Still Dead this week. Even if you don't watch Angel, it might be worth listening to that episode because damn. Um, but also over on Still Dead, at one point I went off on the whole vagina dentata thing, right? Yes. Which is which is a very specific patriarchal expression of a generalized idea about the danger of female sexuality. Yeah. And that, you know, that a woman, uh, you know, who is in control of her sexuality, you know, like men can't be, um, you know, can't like control themselves around her and all. And she's a threat to men sexually. And so choosing for her to uh, kiss the life out of people, mostly men, she does go for Willow, you know, in a pinch. Right. (laughs) But she's she's very heteronormative in her approach. And I mean, fine. She died 500 years ago. The world was a different place then. Right. The world was a different place, you know, 20 minutes ago. It's, it's moving fast is what I'm saying. Um, so so here we have her with her dangerous sexuality, sucking the life out of all of these men so that she can maintain her own. It is kind of a it has a Bathory esque sort of mm. feel to it, although it's not bathing in blood like it is, you know, stealing the life of others to preserve your own yeah um you know and if i didn't and this is one of these things where we have this element where things happen so often um that we have repeated themes and tropes that we go back to over and over again which which serve to solidify certain ideas in our culture like the dangerous female sexuality right um things that remain unquestioned so I think in this very specific circumstance that in and of itself in a little bubble, like, you know, it, we're not sending that message. Mm-hmm. We're not sending the message, I think, of, of the dangerous vagina. Right. Um, and not, but I don't know, like in the context of everything else that I've been watching, especially specifically within Joss Whedon context, mm-hmm. it's still something that I find a little troubling. And I was wondering what your thoughts were on that. Well, What I picked up on more so than her dangerous sexuality was her desire to experience her sexuality. It's not Mm -hmm. just that she wanted to live. It's that she wants to experience love. Yes. Mm -hmm. So there's this great kind of push pull with her Mm -hmm. of she wants to experience her sexuality. That opportunity was taken away from her. So she is going on this, she's going on this journey of self-exploration. Yes. And, but it's, it's dangerous for her and for everyone around her. Mm -hmm. And I think there's something to that that is more a reflection of Buffy Mm -hmm. than it is any sort of you know, leaning really hard on the trope of, you know, the femme fatale, the woman who is dangerous because she's sexy. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I think it's 
that that scene backstage where she takes uh Jonathan backstage and the lighting is all like orange and shadowy and there's yeah. some like serious it it was a little bit of softcore porn lighting backstage at the bronze it really really was it really was and jonathan by the way played by danny strong we haven't named him yet no. we won't name him for a while but we're gonna see him around whenever we need kind of a, a teenage boy to to put in danger we often put jonathan and danny strong as jonathan in that space um he'll be named later we'll find out who he is later but because this is a spoiled podcast and we all know who jonathan is then you know fine but anyway yeah <laughs> Yes. yes. Back to the porn lighting. Yes, the yes, porn lighting. Absolutely. The fantastic mm-hmm. porn mm-hmm. lighting. I think that if you wanted to go really, really deep into ideas about female sexuality in this episode, you yeah. could. Um, mm-hmm. Because I just, I like that having a relationship is really what she's interested in. Now, I think it's unfortunate yeah. that she has that relationship with Xander because Xander mm-hmm. treats her like crap <laughs> and she loves it. And that, that right. to me was the thing that raised a red flag more so than, mm-hmm. oh, it's the kiss of death. Her, her sexuality is dangerous. It was, here's this man who's being so, so just Ugh. <laughs> I can't. We get some of the worst Xander that has ever Xandered in this episode. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But she loves it. And mm-hmm. I know she's been dead for 500 years. I know she hasn't had a lot of opportunities to date. Right. And compared to the boys who killed her back then, I yeah. mean, he's a catch. Yeah. Right. Ugh. He feeds, he feeds her a Twinkie. Oh, my God. Right. Oh, my God. Do I. <laughs> You're going to make me talk about the Twinkie, the goddamn... You can... I, I would love oh to hear God. you talk about the Twinkie. The way he describes the Twinkie, I'm like, Xander, stop talking about your white penis. No one <laughs> cares. <laughs> no one cares about your spongy, cream-filled white oh, penis. <laughs> That's not true. That's not fair. Somebody cares. There, Somebody cares. Someone cares. Willow cares. That's fine. Yes. Willow cares. Yes. Unfortunately. It's, yes. Mm-hmm. You know what? <laughs> I should not be so judgmental. There's something for everyone. But oh my God, the like mm-hmm. how to fellatio of snack foods. I just can't. I'm like, nope, mm-hmm. nope, I'm out. I'm out. <laughs> and then he continues to talk with that Twinkie in his mouth. And yes. it's supposed to be funny. And I'm just like, no, I, uh-uh. no, that's where my yeah. boundary is. <laughs> nope. Nope. Why? Why is that scene there? Why? It's so upsetting to me. I think, I think it's supposed to be cute. God damn it. I think it's supposed to be cute. Yeah. God damn no, I'm clearly a, not the target a... demographic then because no. Okay, uh, clearly not. Clearly not. Yeah. No. No. All right. So um, so I guess let's get into what are you wearing? Oh, my gosh. Right? Um, what do we got this week for that? Well, <laughs> I feel very called to say something about Willow's charming bucket hat. And yeah. I got nothing. Like, I have no idea what it means, but it's adorable. It's just adorable. It's no, so and actually, cute. Willow's hats are the reason why I started knitting. No. I started knitting because she has a yellow hat that has, like, stripes of color, like, little, you know, pearled stripes of color around it in a couple of places. And I loved that hat. And I was like, I got to... And there was also actually a... um there was a pair of mittens that Lane wore on Gilmore Girls that I saw. And I was like, I want those mittens, but I couldn't find the mittens. So I learned how to knit so I could make this stuff. I fucking love that. That's... <laughs> well, I will see if I can make you a willow hat. That'd be really oh my fun. God, I need a willow hat. I love. I will totally make I you a willow hat. I love her hat. We get some other, we get some mm-hmm. more great willow overalls in this yes. episode. Mm-hmm. Um, She's adorable. So cute. But, and I like, I like that Ampata's clothing looks sort of androgynous i sort of believe that maybe she stole this out of the luggage of oh yeah the real, i think she was supposed to steal it from the boys luggage. the real ampada yeah. um but mm-hmm. i i really wonder where where she is supposed to have gotten that dress that she wears to the, For dance. the dance yes i mean it it looks like it may have been the dress that she was 
buried in, but that was kind of shroudy at that point. I mean, 500 years yeah, doesn't look good. I mean, unless her dress was resurrected along with her. Oh. Which, I mean, yeah. magical universe, why I mean, the hell magic, not, right? Sure. So, I mean, I... I think it was the dress that she was buried in, but I'm not entirely sure. And I don't remember from that scene if her dress was, you know, reanimated as well. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. I don't know. Huh. Mm. But there's, I mean, if we start pulling it, like, how come this? I mean, we're never going right, to be done no. with this episode. There's, exactly. Like, there's a point where that just doesn't, and it doesn't really matter. It makes no sense. You know, yeah. in, the, in the big, like the narrative scheme of things, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Um, so, but, you know, yeah, an, I don't know. An ancient. <laughs> I don't know. It was kind of, it was kind of weird. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mummy under no glass, you know, <laughs> they're like there's yeah. the museum with no security whatsoever. People can just walk in right. in the middle of the night looking for oh, sure. parts of a plate and, yeah. and leave a, a dead carcass for some janitor to find oh my god too you know, i just presu- keep thinking about the janitor's job like the next day when he walks in he's like what the fuck with this right janitors in sunnydale man that's have the worst <laughs> they, i hope they get hazard pay i really really do all oh right so let's arg the patriarchy oh my god the patriarchy um, the patriarchy. Jesus, you are the chosen one. Right. You must die. You have no choice. So we have not one, but two patriarchal cultures, one of which is the Watchers and the Slayers, and the other one of which is whatever culture this girl came from, and the possibility that she was a Slayer, so it was also part of that. But, like, the young girl that has to die, that has to be sacrificed, let's sacrifice the girls. Yeah. Like... Jesus. And I don't blame her for coming out of that and then just wanting to kill men. Like, right. Well, Yeah. <laughs> I'd kill anybody I mean, who was going to try to stop me. I mean, and I like that it's framed in terms of choice, which, of course, yes. was the big feminist cause for years and years and years. Um, mm-hmm. And in some ways still is. We've just expanded it to include choice in, you know, a more yeah. intersectional <laughs> mm-hmm. space. But, yeah, you have no choice. Welcome to. Yeah. Welcome to the patriarchy. We are going you to take no away choice. your bodily autonomy and, right. uh, you know, anything that you might possibly want to achieve for yourself because this yeah. is your role. Women Deal with it. are literally objectified in so many ways. I mean, we talk about objectification in the sense of, you know, a man looks at you and sees boobs or legs or whatever it is that he you know particularly likes, right? Mm-hmm. Um, without seeing a human there. But like objectified as sacrifice. Objectified as as things that are owned, not people that live. And the the lack of choice that is involved because your choices are being made for you Mm -hmm. um you know and the fact that we're still fighting to do that to women you know we still have to fight that fight now yep you know um is appalling yeah and yet here it is Mm -hmm. you know and it's it's so you look at that and it's just it's as patriarchal as possible and the thing is like the watchers thing is so also hugely patriarchal Mm -hmm. it's also you know like buffy and empata are not a million miles apart yeah. You know, in their lived experience. So, um, yeah, yeah it's, and it's tough. And Buffy's empathy for her at the end, I, I understand. Yeah. You know, I understand Buffy's empathy for her. And I understand her wanting to be like Buffy, the way she expresses wanting to have yes. a normal life mm-hmm. and wanting to be part of this world where at least her her perception i think is that she has more options right and that's too much to ask yeah right it's too much to ask she wants a normal life right yeah. that's all she wants she's not asking for anything exceptional mm-hmm. and you know and also like I mean, I know this isn't what we were going for. She was a monster and she was killing people. We don't want to, like, you know, forgive that, right? <laughs> but, like, it's magic. Like, we can't find another way to get her her life. Right. Like, we can't right. give this we poor can't. child a happy ending of some sort. I mean, I know she killed people. And once you kill people, that's it. You got to be stopped. Yeah. But, yeah. I mean. <laughs> and she tried to kill Willow. And she tried to kill Xander. Yeah. And she knocked Giles out. And she put th- Buffy in a sarcophagus. So, yeah. All right. But, like, at a certain point, you know. <laughs> yeah. Like, I don't know. We almost get. I don't know. Yeah. We, we almost get a girl kiss, though. And that was, you yeah. know. 
Almost, that was something. almost. But of course, it's not. It's not about desire. No. It was about necessity no. in life because we all know that gay relationships don't exist yet in this no. universe. No, especially because uh, last time we had Willow and Cordelia in the closet for <laughs> in the closet, <laughs> literally in the closet, in praying the closet. Yes, yes, <laughs> praying. Yes, if you're in the closet, you should pray. <laughs> I exactly. Know. I don't. I, mm. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Yeah. All right. So did you have a girl power moment of the week? Um, I didn't, but I think you do. I think I do. Yeah. I think I, I think do. your girl power, as usual, is Willow. Yeah, it's Willow. It's almost always Willow. Willow telling Xander to take him out to the dance. That is so gracious, so loving and powerful, you know, yeah. because she's she is saying like, I love this guy, you know, he's not into me. I am not going to make him feel bad about that. I'm not going right. to, you know, try to manipulate him into a situation where he's taking me to the dance instead of Ampata. He wants Ampata. I want Ampata for him. And she hands that over. Like, that is powerful. That is personal power, mm -hmm. you know, that she is making this choice for herself, that this is the person that she is. Yeah. You know, um, so it's about him. It's about loving him. But it's also about honoring who she is as a person, that that's the kind of thing that she does, because that's who she is. And she knows who she is. And I love that. Yeah, and she's not, you know, she said it before. She's not interested in having Xander if he doesn't yeah. want to be with her. Exactly. And I love and, that. And, or trying to manipulate him yeah. into something or, you know, make him feel bad or anything like that. She's not playing any of those games, you know, and I love that about Willow. Yay, Willow. And she gets She's odds. so cool. And she's going to get Oz. All right. It's so great. <laughs> I know. So speaking of Oz, let me ask you, Noelle. I, I can predict where this is going, but what is your favorite part? My favorite part is Oz. Oz. Yes. Oz, Oz, Oz. Anytime Oz yes. is on screen i i just oh he brings me so much joy so much joy i know um he's so great yeah, yeah. so i called dibs on oz what's your favorite part i know because you called dibs on <laughs> oz i am choosing my second favorite part um and uh and basically it's when it's the whole thing with willow and buffy you know where willow says i can wait for xander to date every other girl in the world or move on and buffy says good for you and willow says i didn't choose yeah. yet <laughs> It's so sweet and it's so vulnerable and it's so lovely. And I love how honest Willow is. She doesn't protect herself. Yeah. You know, by dissembling or lying or pretending that she feels a different way from how she feels. Yeah. Like her honesty, her straightforwardness, like all of it is so incredibly strong and speaks to just who Willow is and how kick ass she is. Yeah. And so I love it. Yeah. That's it for today. To join in the discussion on Twitter, follow Lonnie at Lonnie Diane Rich and me at Noelle Aloud and use the hashtag still pretty. You can also visit the Chipperish forums. Go to chipperish.com, click on forum and join in the fun. Or you can keep Chipperish Media going to the tune of a dollar a month or more and gain access to the live chat in Discord where you can hang out with Noelle and me and all the Chipperish patrons who travel with a mummified corpse but don't pack a lipstick. Visit patreon.com slash chipperish to find out more. You can also show your support by giving Still Pretty a great review on Apple Review. What is wrong with my <laughs> mouth? <laughs> this is early. It's early and I'm tired. <clears throat> You can also show your support by giving Still Pretty a great review on Apple Podcasts or by telling your friends about the show or by sacrificing your life to save Willow from an evil mummy kiss of death. It's probably easier to just write a review. <laughs> we will be back next time with Reptile Boy, the fifth episode of season two. Until then, one day we're going to live in a town where evil curses are just generally ruled out without even saying. <laughs>